OK, so now with us uh, we have our Board of Health Chair, Mayor Andy Mitchell, uh, to start us off with some opening remarks. Please go ahead, Andy. Thank you, Brittany. COVID-19 continues to be a risk both in Ontario and in the local Peterborough community. As Dr. Kieran Moore, Ontario's Medical Officer of Health, wrote this week, we should expect cases to begin to rise as we enter the fall and as more people head indoors. He also said, however, that this is not a cause for panic. Case rates will fluctuate, but thanks to the protection offered by vaccines, the impact will not be the same as during previous waves of the pandemic. Dr. Moore went on to make some important points. The most important metric in determining the effectiveness of vaccines will be hospital and ICU admissions. These indicators will need to be closely monitored. If you are vaccinated and get infected, what's known as a breakthrough case, your symptoms should be milder and have less severe health impacts for you personally and on the healthcare system generally. Ontario will not hesitate to deploy localized and targeted public health measures as necessary to keep us safe with a goal to minimize disruptions. Dr. Moore stressed that the approach going forward to manage COVID-19 has two basic components. First is to continue to practice basic but non-intrusive public health measures that we know will work, such as wearing face coverings in indoor public settings, good hand hygiene, staying home if we are ill and getting tested. And second is to get vaccinated with both a first and second dose and to do so sooner rather than later. Thousands of people have stepped up and gotten vaccinated in the Peterborough region. To date, over 200,000 doses have been administered here locally. Thank you to all who have stepped up and to all the professionals and volunteers who have helped make this happen. However, the job is not complete and we need everyone who is able to, to get their shots. Peterborough Public Health will be taking steps to reach out to those who may have found it difficult in the past. Please take the first opportunity that presents itself. It is the surest way to keep our community safe, our institutions open, and our economy operating. Stay safe, be well, and in all things, be kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Mitchell. OK, so now uh, to uh, walk us through these next few slides, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce Donna Cherpy. Uh, please go ahead, Donna. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I do have the pleasure of um, relating the current uh, number of cases, and this is as of yesterday at 4 p.m. I'd just like to share that we are currently following two active cases and 15 close contacts. And there was a moment over this past weekend when we actually stood at zero active cases. However, it didn't take very long before we did um, receive a new case, at which time it was reported. Uh, we continue to have days with no new cases, so hopefully we'll continue to enjoy low numbers for a while, although we do expect to see increases in local cases similar to the increases that are currently um, occurring elsewhere in the province as we head into the fall. The next slide, please. Uh, so here you see our weekly case counts and that they do remain low. This graph does signify that we are indeed at the end of a third wave. Uh, it will be interesting to see how we experience the fourth wave, considering our strong vaccination rates, which I'll share in a moment. And as Mayor uh, Mitchell noted, uh, tracking hospitalizations and ICU, use of ICU beds because of COVID will be a more helpful way to understand the fourth wave as we go along. It is encouraging to see that PRHC is currently reporting no hospitalizations due to COVID-19 um, earlier this week. Next slide, please. On this slide, uh, you do, uh, to the left, you can see that there are slightly more women, men than women who have tested positive for COVID-19 in Peterborough. And the bar graph on the right is showing the, the age group of the new cases over the past four weeks. 
and you can since July 14th, you can see that those under 29 years of age represented most new cases reported to us. However, it is interesting to note that there continues to be a higher number of cases in the 50 to 59 age group, which also has a slower, a slightly lower vaccination rate compared to the rest of the province, as you'll see in a moment. Next slide, please. I am pleased to report that we continue to have no active COVID outbreaks in our community and congratulate all of those um, congregate settings for, for their uh, work in um, continuing infection patrol, um, prevention and control measures and for high vaccination rates. The next slide, please. So this map um, shows you Peterborough's weekly case incidence rates as it compares to the rest of the province. And on the right side of the scale, you can see that the weekly case incidence rates that we are uh, closely monitoring. And for the period ending August 7th, it decreased substantially to 1.4 cases per 100,000 from last week's rate of 9.5. And it's good to see that our rates are notably lower than the provincial rate of 12.8 cases per 100,000. And with this map, we are showing the case incidence rates over the past 14 days in each region of the province. And again, Peterborough uh, is shown to be in the green along with much of the province. Uh, however, you can see incidence rates around the Golden Horseshoe starting to increase as more of those health units are in yellow than last week. And moving on to wastewater surveillance, our, our data from our uh, wastewater surveillance continues to be very encouraging. The red bars represent Peterborough and the blue Millbrook's uh, wastewater testing results. And the city continues with very low levels being detected and there is no signal for, uh, of COVID in the wastewater in Millbrook. Next slide, please. So this is the data for current vaccination um, as the, uh, at the end of yesterday's clinics. And starting on the left, far left, the half circle charts, you can see that we are inching towards the targets issued by the province with almost 80% of local residents received their first dose and 71.6% who are fully vaccinated. And last week, uh, 589 more residents received their first dose and just over 2,600 more residents received their second dose. In the center chart, you can see the coverage of local adults 18 plus is tracking well. And we continue to closely monitor the vaccination rates among youth 12 to 17 as shown in the right hand chart. This week, we are reporting just over 72% who have received a first dose and 54.4% are now fully vaccinated. And that's up from 43% last week. That's a more than 10% increase over the past week. The first dose is showing signs of plateauing and actually only increased 1.7% this past week. And we hope to address that issue when the school, when school year starts again by offering vaccination clinics in schools this fall. Next slide, please. And here in this bar graph, you can see the percentages of first and second doses by age bands. And it's interesting to see the youngest age bands starting to outpace those in their 20s and 30s, despite being the last group to become eligible for vaccine. And the next slide. Um, to the left on this slide, you can see how our vaccination rates stack up for our community as a whole, which includes everyone, children 12 years um, and above. Uh, and last week, our rates inched up very slightly with 7.7% now, now vaccinated with one dose and 63.4% with their second dose. Sorry, this is a community, community as a whole, total population, not just 12 plus my error. Um, this map from August 9th shows how our fully vaccinated rates compared to the rest of the province. It shows we're keeping pace with our fellow health units and have just surpassed the 70% mark. So we can expect to move into the blue category next week. And in terms of the full population, most regions stand at around 50 to 60% coverage. Overall, we still have work to do to reach the almost 
um, 13 and a half thousand residents who are eligible for vaccine to achieve a, a, a local vaccination rate of 90 percent. And so th that's the ends of the of the slides. Um, However, I just would like to provide a few remarks um, and pick up on the theme of our ongoing efforts to vaccinate as many local residents as possible so we can reach those herd immunity rates and protect our community. Firstly, I'd really like to extend my personal thanks to the nearly 105,000 local residents who have stepped up to get vaccinated. We don't have to look too far to see how other parts of the world are faring due to low vaccination rates, which has enabled the Delta variant to take hold and cause a fourth wave. The higher we can get our local vaccination rates will not only mean fewer cases, but it will also result in less severe illness suffered by those who become infected with COVID-19. The Delta variant has proven itself to be much more transmissible and more dangerous. So I can't stress enough how important it is that everyone get vaccinated that's eligible or that can be vaccinated to prevent the virus's ability to spread. We understand that there are some residents who aren't necessarily against vaccination, but don't see the need for vaccination because when they look at their lifestyle, they don't travel much. They tend to stick in the, to the same small group of people and don't consider themselves a risk to others. Even if you don't think you're likely to catch the virus, we still urge you to get vaccinated because in the months ahead, there's no way of knowing who you may come into contact with by simply going to a store, a school, or a family gathering or other community interaction, no matter how nominal. And it's only when we reach herd immunity levels of 90% or more can we start to relax a bit and we're just not quite there yet. So please help us get to the 90%. We appreciate for many that there have been barriers to getting vaccinated. So Peterborough Public Health is doing all it can to bring vaccine to the community. The Evan Rood Clinic continues Mondays through Thursdays until August 19th and, and for both walk-ins and the booking system, which is still in place and until then, if you'd prefer to book an appointment. In addition, we are holding and planning dozens of walk-in clinics throughout the city and county, including one in Millbrook on August 17th and another in Havelock on August 18th. And this week on Saturday, we will be at the Beavermead Park under the pavilion from 9 to 3 p.m. And I just encourage everyone to check our online walk-in clinic schedule for upcoming dates and locations and check back often as this is constantly updated. And you can find it at our website at www.peterborowpublichealth.ca slash walk-in. To make it even more worthwhile or your while to get vaccinated, each dose earns you a chance to enter two contests to win great prizes. And we are holding a weekly draw for two $50 gift, gift cards to spend in downtown Peterborough. Plus, you can enter the Get a Shot to Take a Shot campaign for a chance to win one of 250 pairs of free tickets to see the Peterborough Peace, plus other, weather, other wonderful prizes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Okay, lots of information there. Uh, so now to uh, bring greetings uh, from uh, the county. I see we have uh, Warden Jones with us today. And if you've got some comments to share, we'd love to um, to put you up on screen. So go ahead, Warden Jones. Okay, I trust you can hear me okay. Can you, Brittany? You sound just great, thanks. Okay, that's good. Okay, I won't, uh, I won't take long just to bring greetings and uh, encourage everyone. I guess what Donna uh, just said, uh, she met with our emergency group at the county yesterday. And uh, I mean, it's good news. I don't wanna be the least bit negative, but I guess the bottom line was county residents could be doing a little bit better. The numbers aren't quite as high as maybe we would like them. I mean, everyone's doing a great job, but we've got to buckle down a little more. And don't go along with the idea that, no, I won't bother getting one. Just what Don was just trying to say. So we are encouraging you, please take that extra little effort and get that uh, vaccine. Now, uh, as you know, the county has been in a, a so-called state of emergency since all this started. And a, a lot of the reasons for that 
was to tell everybody, to be symbolic, that we take this thing seriously and we all need to take it very seriously. And we've been uh, guided by our public health department every step of the way. So we have decided not to get rid of our emergency status just yet. We want those numbers to get up to a, a place that we're really comfortable with. So uh, I hope all county residents, please, Take advantage of the clinics in Millbrook on the 17th of August, in Havelock on the 18th of August. And you can come into Peterborough, too, of course, at the Avenue Center or anywhere where they're offering them. So, so let's give it the good old county try and let's see if we can get those numbers uh, as high as we possibly can. So please give them a call. Go on the website. Uh, phone your family doctor. Go to... Uh, the, walk-in clinics at the pharmacy, anything you can do. Let's uh, let's everyone show that the county can really get those numbers up there. So all in all, we're in this together, like I always like to say. So let's reach out to each other and help us get protected. We can do this. So keep smiling and thank you to everyone who's working uh, so hard on this. Please get the shot. We'd like it a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Warden Jones. I think we need to come to you for our next tagline. Yeah, um, we'll work on that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Okay. So uh, now uh, is our opportunity to hear from our media guests. Uh, I wonder, uh, Donna, if you wouldn't mind putting on your camera, if it's cooperating for you today. And um, let's start with uh, Taylor Clysdale from Peterborough this week. I think you were one of the first on the call. So we'll, we'll start off with you, Taylor. Please go ahead if you've got questions. Oh, and I should mention we have Inspector uh, John Lyons with us from the Peterborough Police if there happen to be any enforcement related questions. Thank you, John, for joining us. So go ahead, Taylor. Uh, thank you. And actually, I will start with uh, uh, John Lyons if, if that's all right. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's been any recent charges or tickets or fines or any enforcement related actions related to COVID lately. Hi Taylor and thank you Brittany. Um, so as of uh, as of this date um, in, in the recent past there has not been any uh, enforcement um, in the in this in the terms of, of uh, tickets being issued. Uh, we do continue to get uh, inquiries regarding uh you know what the limits are on safe gatherings um what the indoor or the outdoor limits are so we're kind of uh back in a in a more of an educational uh point moving forward um but not receiving any complaints in particular about uh large gatherings or uh situations where people are non-compliant so uh that's where we're kind of sitting right now, Taylor. Excellent, perfect. And that's actually pretty great to hear. Um, I'll uh, move my questions over then to uh, Donna. Uh, first question then is, you know, uh, you said during your opening remarks that, you know, uh, as people move indoors, we should be expecting that, you know, there is going to be more cases. Uh, I'm wondering too, if uh, the students returning to the community uh, for the, the uh, upcoming semester, is it expected that they'll be bringing COVID back with them and that that might contribute to more cases in our community? I, there is that definite possibility and that's one of the reasons we're working closely with our post-secondary institutions to help them um, ensure that all of the students going into residence are, are vaccinated. So um, the local post-secondary students do or, or have developed policies to um, have students in residence be vaccinated and we're also offering or will be offering clinics to other students who live off campus and and staff uh, to be vaccinated and exploring other points of leverage to reduce the the um, likelihood that that we may have uh, outbreaks again in in the um, school so we're, we're in a much better position than we probably were with the third wave in with the opportunities for vaccination um, 
I think when a lot of people think back to kind of the post-secondary situation of the pandemic, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people would think back to the Severn Court outbreak that did lead to a death. Um, are we likely to see something like that again? Or have we gotten to the point where, you know, with mandatory vaccinations for students and res, that, uh, you know, something like that isn't likely to happen again? The vaccine actually provides pretty good coverage and from even though we don't have local data, um, provincial data is is demonstrating that or we don't have good numbers for local data where the we are the provincial data is demonstrating that vaccination provides um, better protection. So the, even though um, people may have um, symptoms, the the severity of the illness if they're vaccinated is um, much less, and so hospitalization and and mortality from the from the disease is is not expected to be at the levels that we were experiencing earlier in the year. Um, just a question in regards to uh, vaccine passports. I know yesterday or the day before um, that uh, the federal government made an announcement for international travel. Uh, I'm just wondering if we can expect anything in regards to vaccine passports at a local level or, or where the health unit stands in that regard. The health unit supports the idea of having um, certificates uh, as those who you have traveled outside of the country and you know if you uh, many countries require a yellow fever vaccine certificate so having those uh, certificates of especially for travel um, is we you know we do support that idea uh, we are looking and I believe the province is also looking to the federal government to continue to pursue a a consistent um, a vaccine um, passport for the purposes of 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 travel And do we know if that tra uh, vaccine passport would be kind of between region to region or province to province, or is that kind of yet to be decided? I think what we're trying to promote is that it would be um, something that would be universal for Canada. Okay, and last question, and I do feel a little bit silly, but you know, it, mm -hmm. it is something that people are wondering, but masks, you know, are we looking at in the short term that, you know, masks are something that we uh, are going to be continuing to wear or, you know, is this a long term thing? Like, uh, I know some people are starting to get pretty sick of wearing them, but. I, I, I understand the sentiment. However, they are very protective and, and you, you know, the, the vaccine provides great uh, protection, but not everybody can be vaccinated. Uh, and, you know, children under 12 um, are not eligible for a vaccine. Uh, so it, it is really important to continue to use face coverings um, while indoors, especially. Or if you, um, you know, complete your personal risk assessment uh, and feel vulnerable because maybe you um, have you're immunocompromised, um, then even in outdoor or crowded situations, you, you might consider continuing to use a face covering. So, the, you know, vaccine is one very strong, effective measure, but it's not the only measure, especially as, uh, as we do um, face a fourth wave. All right, perfect. I think that's everything on my part. Thank you so much, Donna and Inspector Lyons. I appreciate the responses. You're welcome. Thank you, Taylor, very much for those good questions. Okay, let's hear from uh, Matt Latour from uh, Oldies and Freak Radio. Go ahead, Matt, if you've got some questions. Uh, yeah, my questions today are for Donna. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me because I'm on a different computer than last week uh, this time around. Sound good. Awesome. Uh, so my question uh, for you, Donna, it's mainly about the vaccination rates now that we're at almost 80% uh, fully vaccinated locally and over 70% with one dose. Is there kind of a fear that maybe anybody that wants to get a vaccine has already done so and that the remaining, you know, 20 percent is just people that can't be convinced? Actually, I would suggest that there are barriers or there have been barriers to vaccination and that there are still many people who want a vaccine. And the evidence I have for that is that 
you know, we are still getting people every day coming to walk-in clinics at the Evinrude um, looking for a first dose and a second dose. So whether those, and, and it's not just the walk-in clinics at the Evinrude, but when we hold pop-ups, we are getting people looking for first and second doses. So that to me is a signal that there have been barriers to getting vaccination and that um, we have some additional work to, to do to reach those people and that there is still an interest. Yes, there are still people that are looking for a, a better understanding of the vaccine and we are we continue to provide those consultations as do uh, you know primary care professionals to help people understand um, the vaccine the safety around the vaccine um, the efficacy um, and and you know the relative um, likelihood of, of any side effects um, the where even those who have had adverse uh, effects from vaccines we continue to provide them with opportunities um, to have a vaccine under medical supervision and um, those avenues are are being accessed by local residents so all in all I think that there is still an appetite for vaccines Perfect. And just because I missed it off the top, could I get your title? Yes, I'm the director of public health programs at Peterborough County City Health or Peterborough Public Health, um, and I'm also the, the the current chief of operations, so our COVID response. Perfect. That's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, okay. So joining us from Havelock, we have uh, Denelda Frazier from the Havelock Rail. Did you have any questions for our speakers today, Denelda? No questions today. OK, great. Thank you for joining us. OK, let's um, move on to Trisha Mason from Global News. I believe I see you with us today. So go ahead, uh, Trisha, if you've got some questions. Thanks, Brittany. I have one question. I also have my colleague Katrina Squaz and he'll be asking a question right after. Uh, but my first question was kind of off of Matt's uh, last question. What kind of barriers do you think are people are experiencing not getting being able to get the COVID vaccine? For pe people in Peterborough, uh, uh, so there, if for people who have lived in or live in the county, um, things like transportation or in a bit or difficulty accessing the provincial vaccine appointment booking system. Um, as you know, it is reliant on pretty good internet. Uh, not all residents in in our uh, region have have that. Um, privilege and so we have heard that that's been a, a um, barrier sometimes hours of operation um, and I think that's why we're seeing you know pretty good uptake at our evening clinics at the Evinrude um, and you know child care or just the ability to get um, a, to, a, to a vaccine close to home um, so that's why we're um, really focusing on getting the vaccine to the people rather than asking people to come to us. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Katrina now. Hi, Donna. I know you were asked earlier about vaccine passports when it comes to travel, but you know, in Quebec, they're implementing a system where you need these passports to access many um, non essential services. So I'm wondering if uh, we could see that in Ontario and if we should see that in Ontario. It's a good question. Um, the the I mean, I think there's a there's a privacy concern with the with the idea of using passports. Um, and you know, I I I wear another hat as a, a privacy officer. Um, so you know, carrying a passport showing um, vaccine vaccination, um, it you know it it could be um, construed as an in, uh, you know not respecting um, your personal health information and your uh, right for confidentiality around that vaccination is you know, part of your your um, personal health information. On the other hand, I mean, I you know, as a, you know, a, an aunt of young children who um, can't get vaccinated, um, um, 
feeling secure, uh, you know, that they're going to an event um, where people are are vaccinated um, and to protect them or, you know, having elderly parents who may, even though vaccinated, may be uh, more immune compromised. I, I do see value in um, in understanding that, you know, that when they're going um, to places that they are vaccinated. And I think this question will come up more and more. Um, we know that long-term care homes have vaccine policies to protect uh, residents. Um, and I know that there are, you know, other workplaces and um, other, um, especially healthcare institutions who are looking at this. Uh, I think the bottom line with the passport is that really what we want to do uh, is is you know feel safe um, and know that we are protect we are protected and that our loved ones are protected. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Tricia and Katrina. Um, all right, let's hear from our examiner colleagues. Maybe we'll start with uh, Joel Kovac. Uh, go ahead, uh, Joel. If you've got some questions. Okay, is Dr. Salvatero away on vacation? She's not in the office today. Okay, excellent. All right, um, my other question, I had some questions of clarification for Donna. Uh, one of them was, I think you mentioned, and I'm not sure if I got this number down correctly, 14,500 area residents uh, are eligible to get the vaccine yet. Is that right? Is that what you said? I think that's close. I think it was 13,000 and some. Um, well, yeah. Okay. I have the number, if it helps, it's 13,400 okay. residents. Okay, is, uh, Brittany, is that the number that is needed to get to 90% or is that the total number of people who are still eligible? It's the total number of eligible residents to get us to 90%. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Okay, all right. Now, um, Donna, you very kindly um, talked about some of the um, the barriers uh, to get a vaccine, and, and I, I was grateful you spoke particularly about county uh, residents because the warden addressed that. But what what is the discrepancy between the county and the city for vaccination rates? Is it somewhat lower in the county? Because he mentioned it, I wondered if you could maybe address that and offer a bit more detail. How much lower is it in the county compared to the city? So our current data would show that it is about 15% um, lower for both pretty much for first doses and second doses. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, and, uh, so you talked about some of the the barriers and internet lack of internet connection being one of them. Okay, thank you so much for addressing that. Uh, you talked also about younger children not being eligible yet. Do we know whether there's I, there must be clinical trials happening on younger children now? Do we have any news on that? We are expecting um, a vaccine or. Ho I hoping that we'll have a vaccine avail available uh, in the winter. So not probably until 2022. Um, my understanding is that the vaccine has to be reformulated uh, for a pediatric dose. Oh, that's good news. All right. Um, and one last thing, it looks as though there will be a fall election. There's there's talk that it could be called potentially on Sunday and that it would be a 36 day um, a 36 day campaign period is is that safe to hold an election right now do you think and what would be some of your advice if an election is coming well i think that it it, it probably safer than it was a, a while ago um however you know we definitely need to ensure that public health measures are upheld including use of you know face coverings and and distancing um because uh, as you know we don't um, know that everybody is we don't know who's vaccinated and who's not vaccinated. And then the, there is a part of the population who cannot be vaccinated, not just those under the age of 12, but other. sometimes there are other reasons why people cannot be vaccinated. So um, I think it can be safe if we are very careful and, and um, really uphold those uh, other public health measures. Um, 
outdoor events or are safer than indoor events. Um, so that may provide some from some strategies for those who are campaigning. That's wonderfully helpful. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Joelle. Uh, okay, Reg Watson, any follow up questions from the examiner? If so, please go ahead. Oh, nothing today. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, unless uh, there's any last minute questions from our media guests, uh, I believe that brings us to a close. And before we sign off, I would like to make everyone aware of a change to our briefing schedule as we are going to be shifting these media briefings to uh, every two weeks. So that means we'll convene again on Thursday, August 26th at 12 noon. And I will be sending out a media advisory uh, with all the details so everyone knows about this. But if you can plan to join us again in two weeks, at the end of August on the 26th, uh, then we will be happy to give you another update. Okay, thank you all. Uh, thanks again to our enforcement partners for joining us. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again in two weeks and stay safe out there. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany.